hello and welcome everyone today. Uh, thank you for joining us for this Lunch and Learn session. I'm Mira English and I'm the Head of Community for Tankstream Labs in our Perth location. Now, for those of you who don't know, Tankstream Labs, we're a co-working space specialised for tech startups, scale-ups and entrepreneurs. We have a global focus um, and we're all about bridging the gaps between corporates and startups and supporting the startup ecosystem in any way that we can. We have three office locations, two over in Sydney and one in Perth. We were founded by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Um, so today we are joined by Cal Davison from Cake Equity. And uh, this session is going to be discussing early stage capital raising. Um, it's a Q&A session. So feel free to pop any questions you have in the Q&A chat below. It's gonna be running for an hour, but anytime you have a question, just chuck it up um, and we'll answer those for you. Um, it's going to be interactive, and I'll pass things over to Cal now. Excellent. Um, let me just share my screen here. Uh, one minute, I'll get into presentation. Cool, taking time. Okay, can you see that okay? Yeah, all good. Awesome. Okay. I, um, Thanks very much for the intro um, and we're excited to be um, talking to the community about um, capital raising pathways for startups. Um, so the um, session that we're going to cover today is really around um, helping you understand what early stage startup funding actually looks like and then how you actually prepare to run those, those initial, initial um, uh, raise rounds. We'll be particularly focusing around um, the earliest stage funding round, so really from uh, pre-seed or friends, family and, 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 and fools rounds, if you like to use that term, uh, through to probably series A round. Um, so deliberately really focusing down on that. And, um, and you should work, walk away from today with a really good understanding of um, the different um, elements that's involved in, in, um, in early uh, stage uh, startup funding. Um, and some real, really good um, tips in terms of how you actually prepare yourself to run a successful raise. But we've also got some awesome resources which we'll actually send to you um, after the uh, workshop as well, which you can really dig down on elements we'll actually cover in the presentation today. Um, as Mara said, we want it to be interactive, so feel free to actually drop questions into chat. Um, if I don't pick them up through chat, she'll actually um, come on and, and uh, just let us um, uh, know the questions as well. And so I'm happy to actually um, answer them as we go through the session and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on CAKE, um, the thing that drives us and, and, and our mission is, is really built around the belief that many of the organisations that are changing the world for the better are coming out of the eco startup ecosystem today. And the problems that we're trying to help um, founders with is there are two big, big problems that, that um, they face that we look to help them with. And, and one is um, pretty much every startup needs to attract investors and needs to actually be able to actually get equity investors in their startup to get them through that early phase until they start making revenue and until they start getting to break even. So getting great investors on board is absolutely critical for your success. And then the other element um, that's critical to um, a startup success is actually building a great team. And unlocking the power that in your employee equity is another really important tool for you to understand and be able to actually use as a startup founder. Now, both of those things, running a capital raise and keeping your investors engaged, and then also um, setting up, running an ESOP to be able to actually give equity incentives to your team is super complex and, and, and has been um, really time consuming and very expensive process for early stage founders to go through. Just, just an absolute nightmare, right? Um, and so um, most people end up doing it really poorly and most people end up spending a lot, way more time, energy and money on it than they need to spend because there's so much friction involved in that whole process. So our mission is to transform that and to really reduce the friction that's involved in that process and just simplify it. And the way that we do that is, is um, twofold. One is we've got a, a beautiful intuitive app that we actually use to help streamline a lot of the process around, around both the capital raising and also around the ESOPs. Um, 
but we also actually do a lot of education and a lot of partnering with people like Tankstream Labs to make sure that we actually can help um, founders understand what they need to do. And then if they do require further advice, we've also got a great network of um, accountants and lawyers and other advisors that we can plug them into to help you navigate through that journey. So, that, so that's what we're all about. Um, so um, just a little bit about, about my background before we go into it. So my um, background is uh, pretty extensively in financial services and, and equity markets. Um, in a past life, I looked after investor relations for National Australia Bank. Um, so I dealt with all the institutional shareholders that, that, that invested in, in NAB. Um, so I was involved in capital raising. I was involved in actually engaging investors and also your broking analysts and everything in that role extensively. But I must say it was very different um, running a capital raise in you know, a, a, a listed entity and particularly one that's in the sort of top 10 in the ASX. You know, if we wanted to run a capital raise, we picked up the phone, we got Minters or one of the most expensive law firms in the country uh, to come in and help us. We'd get Merrill Lynch or, or, or Goldman Sachs or one of the investment banks to come in and we'd pay them millions of dollars. And it'd take a while to run a raise, but we'd have a lot of help as we go through that process. And look, the reality is for most founders, they don't have the luxury of being able to actually have people like that on call. Um, so again, that's why we've actually developed the platform that we have to help streamline that process for you. And so I'm really looking forward to actually spending some time today helping demystify and show you um, how to actually run a, a capital early um, stage capital raise effectively, but also to actually provide you with some tools that you can go away from today that really should be able to help you accelerate that whole process and, and have a much greater chance of actually running a successful raise round. So um, the three things we're going to go through today, um, I'm going to talk about the, the, the fundraising framework and, and like some of the things you need to be thinking about uh, as you go through the different rounds. And, and one of the themes that will come out here is it's not just the, the fundraising round that you need to the, be thinking about the one you're doing right now, but you need to be thinking forward as well, you know, um, and it's really important. I'll, and that's a theme that I really want to emphasize today. And it's one of the key takeaways I want you to take away. It's like not just getting your first funding round, you've got to be thinking about future rounds and make sure you're not doing stuff early on that's going to create headaches for you down the track. We'll talk about some of the technical stuff. I'm not going to go into an extensive deep dive around term sheets and everything here, but we will touch on some of that. Um, and because you will need to know that as you go through a, a funding round. Um, and then the last one, we'll talk about where to pitch. And we'll also talk about where you will actually um, be looking to tap into the investors who might be um, wanting to actually participate in your, in your startup growth, right? So let's start out with the overview of rules of thumb. So just to set up uh, um, here, um, you know, pretty much every startup goes through this belly of, of death phase before they actually get to break even. And then even when they're actually in break even, in order for you to be able to actually realize the potential of your startup and accelerate your growth um, and get you to the goals you want to go, most startups, even once they're in this break even phase, have to go through subsequent funding rounds. We're going to focus more mostly in this early stage um, uh, here. But really, um, you know, being able to actually attract investors, being able to run a successful uh, funding round is pretty much life and death for most startups um, uh, that, that we see in the market. So it's really important that you know how to actually do this properly. It's really important as well that you understand what's actually required, both in terms of effort, but also focus to get it done. So this um, here is, is really just to actually give you a context of the um, uh, types of capital flows that are actually available in, in um, startup land. Um, this one's the data here is from 2019 in the chart. But if you rolled it forward to 2020, and particularly if you roll it forward into, into 2021, you would see a massive increase this year in terms of the amount of, of capital that's going into early stage startups. About six weeks ago, we actually had um, the first um, uh, the first uh, week where we had a billion dollars invested in early stage startups in Australia. And like if you went back just a couple of years ago, that would have been basically like, you know, six months or maybe perhaps even a year of investment flows into early stage startups. So the key message out of this is 
there is capital that's actually actively investing in early stage startups. If you do have a good idea and if you have the right team around you um, and you can actually position yourself properly, you will get funding for your, for your startup, right? So absolutely know that, but it's not without work, right? And, and, and one, of the, one of the articles um, that I'll, I'll, I'll send out after this to you as well and share with you is a, is a Medium article, which talks about a typical seed stage funding round. And they talk about it being a six month process from when you actually start engaging investors to when you want the, the money in the door. So six months, right? And for the first three months of that period, one co-founder needs to be devoting about 20% of their time to, to that. Um, and then during that last six, uh, three, month, uh, three months of that six month period, um, a co-founder needs to be devoting around 80% of their time for that, right? So yes, there are the miracle stories where you know, someone um, uh, goes out and raises a, a round in, in two minutes flat and they get one investor that comes in and actually takes out their whole, whole round. But for most of you, it's not going to be the reality. So make sure when you're going into this process, you're realistic about the time and energy and effort that it will re be required in order for you to actually run a successful round. So um, there is um, there are buckets and there are um, uh, rounds, um, as we refer to them, that um, investors expect to see when you're actually presenting them with an investment opportunity. And so we talk about pre-seed, as I said, that can also be referred to friends and family rounds or triple F friend, family and fools round. Um, and, and you're typically gonna see a valuation in a pre-seed raise somewhere between one and three million. I will say valuations have certainly been higher in the last six months or so. So you might even see some of those pre-seed uh, rounds um, raises recently um, stretching to sort of $5 million valuation, but you typically, you'll see um, at this stage, um, you'll be looking to raise somewhere between 10 and 15% equity, which will give you an amount that you're trying to raise somewhere between you know, 200 and 400. Again, if it was off a five mil valuation, that would be five, uh, uh, 500K and it might be up to 750K if you're, if you're issuing 15% equity, right? Um, so that's the pre-seed and then you've got seed uh, and then you've got a series A here. Um, so the thing to understand about this is that um, when you go out and start engaging investors and talking to them about investing in your startup, they will have expectations around how you fit into these buckets, right? And they will be a bit different based on the type of startups you've got, but it's important that you understand what the buckets are for your type of startup. And also it's important you actually um, align yourself to, to where you're at with it. And you know, a pre-seed raise, you might be in the, in, the, in, the, in the phase where you're actually going out and raising funding there to actually build your MVP, you know? And your seed stage might be where you're actually, you've got some customers on and you're looking to actually scale that and build out your beachhead market, right? And your series A round might be when you're actually going from your beachhead market to an adjacent market, or maybe you're expanding globally, right? So they are gonna have ex expectations around how you fit into these buckets. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's important you understand it and it's important you actually fit into one of these buckets. If you don't, um, then you're gonna be just, it's gonna be harder to convince um, investors from the start to invest in you if you're not fitting into, a, into one of these typical rounds that they, they would expect to see for your type of startup business. Uh, Cal, just um, someone's asked a question, and as a, a example, um, how was Cake funded pre-seed, seed, and Series A, etc.? So we had um, quite a lot of um, uh, angels early on in our process, right? So, um, so yeah, um, we had a lot of angels, and and we probably had quite a, a large cap table um, for the stage that our business was at. But we were also in a position where we started um, and pivoted the business about two and a half years ago. So we had some uh, investors from the early business and then, and then pivoted. Um, we've recently run a, a seed round ourselves. Um, and and that, the lead investor for that round was Jason Calacanis, who some of you might know, but he's like probably one of the top five angel investors globally, early stage investor in Uber, uh, Carmack and, um, and Robinhood. 
Um, so we've recently run a seed round and we're looking to run a series A early next year. And so, so for us, the seed, you know, that pre, the, the, the pre-seed funding effectively was to actually build our product out um, and, and, um, and really actually build our presence in, in, in the market here in Australia. The seed round, um, which was probably between seed and series A really, but the, the funding round that we've just done is all about actually taking our, our platform global. Um, so we have expanded into Singapore and we're about to expand into UK, et cetera. So that's about global expansion. And the next one will be really about scaling our positions in those markets. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I'll just um, go over to, um, uh, so I, I see, see there's a couple of questions there. Many accelerators seem to offer 20 to 100K for nearly 10%. Yes, that's correct for an early stage um, uh, startup. So yeah, generally they, they will want, you know, maybe five to 7% equity. Um, and look, I'll, I'll talk to this now about um, the dilution, but it's really important that you actually don't give away too much equity too early on. Um, so this is just a, a modeling out some um, funding uh, round. So we've got a seed round here um, and then going through to a series C round, right? And so you can see here, if you're the CEO and co-founder of this business, um, the lead founder, you start at this point when you're running a seed round, um, you've actually um, given away 20% equity to your investors. They've given you a million dollars on a $4 million pre-money pre, pre valuation. So at this point in time, <clears throat> your equity stake in the business is worth one and a half million dollars, right? What you can see is every time you go through a funding round, you're giving away, um, you're, you're, you're creating more shares and therefore you're giving away a piece of the pie uh, to a new investor that's coming in or an investor that, a repeat investor that's putting more money into you. Um, therefore, in order to do that, your piece of the pie is getting smaller each round you're actually going through. And you can see here, you go from 30% down to 20%, down to 15% and down to 12%, right? But what you're relying on is that the valuation uplift that you're actually getting from deploying those funds effectively and growing your startup is going to offset the dilution that you're getting as you bring those new investors on. And you can see that in the example here. So at, at that seed round stage, I own 20% of, of, of the business, uh, sorry, 30% of the business. My stake in the business was worth 1.5 mil. But by the time I get to Series C, I only own 12% of it, but the post, the post money value at that point is $100 million. So my stake, my 12% is worth $12 million as compared to the $2.5 million when I went through that, that C round, right? So that's dilution um, and that's how it works. And you can see it's not only the actual uh, me as a, as a lead founder or CEO that's been diluted, it's also the employee option plan and the other founders that have been diluted as you go through, and it will also be your early stage investors if they don't participate in, in, in the subsequent rounds as well, right? All of those people will be diluted as they go through, but what you're counting on is the valuation uplift is more than making up for that dilution as they go through. Now, the important thing is to understand this concept. The other important element here is when you go through a seed round, you need to be factoring in the effect of that dilution as you go through subsequent rounds, right? And we call this modeling your cap table. So you'll need to actually think about, okay, what does my holding look like after I give away this 20% in this round? But also what's the next round that I'm likely to do? And what's the round after that likely to do? And, and you need to account for that and model it out because if you give away too much equity upfront, then you can get into a position where you've got too small a piece of the pie by the time you get to a series B, for example, and that can turn our investor off um, participating in, in, your, in your investment round, right? Because they'll come in and they'll go, um, look, you know, Myra, you're, you're the key driver here. You're the lead founder of this business, but you've only got 2% equity. I don't think you've got enough skin in the game here. Therefore, I'm not going to invest in you, right? So it's really important that even from the early stage uh, funding rounds, you actually are thinking about what dilution looks like as you go through the next two to three rounds of funding. Uh, so we've also had a question 
Uh, what are your thoughts on avoiding the early stage valuation equity conversation altogether using uh, SAFE or CON notes? I'll come to that in a little while and we'll talk about SAFE and CON notes, but yeah, that's definitely something that's, that's worth while, while doing, yeah. yeah. No problem. Um, so just here are some tips and, um, around running you know, pre-seed round. Um, so focus on rules of thumb, not details. If you get a, an investor at an early stage that's wanting you know, a five-year financial forecast um, to invest in a pre-seed round um, and they want to um, drill down to the nth degree to do this detailed due diligence, then it's probably a good signal to run in the opposite direction, right? Um, really at this stage, it's about them actually understanding who you are, who your co-founders are, the strength of your team, your passion for the problem, why it's a problem that's worth solving and why, what are your unique insights in terms of actually solving that problem, right? So that's really what it's about at this point. It's about relationships. So it is important that, that even in the early stage, they're investing in you and your idea um, more than any financial forecast or valuation or anything like that. So it's really important that you build those relationships over time. Put some money aside for the cost that it's going to, the advice that you're going to need to actually um, run that, that early stage funding round. There'll be some legal fees there, there'll be some accounting fees. Make sure you allocate some funding for that. Um, Think about that future rounds. As I said, I keep coming back to this point. It's one I want you to take away today is even if you're running your first, very first funding round, you need to be thinking ahead. And it's not just about the dilution effect. If you actually have an investor coming on at an early stage, which actually, and you agree to terms with them, that's actually not fair and reasonable for you as a founder and a company, then it's likely to create problems for you down the track, right? Because other investors come on will be going, why has that early stage investor got um, uh, uh, got uh, voting rights or, 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 or whatever it is that's actually unreasonable and gives them undue control, which they shouldn't have over the business. Um, make sure you are um, thinking about valuation, even if you're using a, 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 um, a, a convertible note or a safe, which we'll actually talk about. But there are methods out there like the Berkus method, which you can actually use to put a valuation <clears throat> around an early stage startup. The Berkus method uses a very qualitative um, uh, framework for, um, <clears throat> for um, coming up with a really early stage um, valuation. So it'll be looking at the strength of your team. It'll be looking at you know, a, a, about five different um, factors and you'll be giving yourself a score between one and 10. And then based on each, based on that score, you'll get a, a value, a dollar value for each one of those. So there are methodologies, even at this really early stage, and it's worthwhile going through it because you will need to be able to actually talk to it, even if you're using a safe or a con note as well. Um, the last one there is just be professional with your equity, right? So make sure you get an ESOP set up, do it early and do it properly. Um, the worst thing you can be doing as a founder is giving away equity on a handshake deal or, 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 or in a way that's not set out properly because um, you're giving it away to someone who's not going to be up, not going to be valuing it properly if they don't have visibility over it. It hasn't been documented properly. There'll always be that doubt in their mind. Um, make sure you do it properly and make sure you're actually getting maximum value out of that equity that you're giving away. Okay, so seed round, um, you're now further progressed with your startup. Um, there is definitely a market out there uh, for seed rounds. Um, there's different valuation methods that you'll be able to look at, like there's a, the equity model that you'll be able to look at because generally by the time you get to seed round, you're going to be um, post revenue. So you'll be able to use some more sophisticated valuation tools um, as you go through it. Um, get more demand than you need. Um, so, you know, I talked before about the fact that, you know, set your expectations. Um, make sure you're realistic about the time it takes to actually run your funding round. And then also be realistic about the amount of time and energy you need to actually put into it. But you also need to be really realistic about the number of people you need to engage to get a funding round done. So if you were running a seed round and you um, are looking to raise a million dollars, and let's say the average check size which you expect to get out to raise that is like 100K, then you're not going to need 10 investors to actually write you a check to actually complete that round. And in order to actually get 
10 investors to write the check, you're probably going to have to start talking to 40 or 50 investors six months beforehand before, they, before you're going to get there. It's just like a sales funnel. You need more prospects up front before you actually get to it. And, and ideally, if you can get to the point where you know, you've actually got 12, 13 or 15 investors that want to actually write you a check and you're oversubscribed, that's the best position to be in. So allocate um, cost um, to actually run the round. Um, again, think about future rounds, do the modeling, um, don't create problems for you down the track. Um, when you're pitching, you're selling equity, you're not selling your product. Particularly, we see technical founders fall into a trap of actually spending all their time talking about the product and actually not enough time talking about you know, the problem they're solving, their team, and why they are the team to back in solving this problem. It's really important. Um, so that's on the C tips. Um, there's a couple of other things here, which, you know, um, before I go, go finish this up, I just want to, want to touch on is, is I've said a couple of times already that at early stage startup, the most important thing that they're investing in is you and your team, your passion for the problem you're solving and your unique insights to solving it. So with that in mind, it's super critical that you are actually looking after yourself and your team as well. And there's some tips here to actually do it because it's super hard to actually get a, a, a startup up and running. So tap into accelerator, incubators, co-working spaces. It's great you're at an event like this, but take advantage of those people. Yes, you might be giving away some, some equity, but we went through Startmate at the beginning of this year. We were quite well advanced in terms of our business and our traction in the market. But I can say, it was an absolute game changer for us, right? And totally worth the equity that we gave away to actually go through that program. Our connection into the highest quality mentors that you can get across um, the startup ecosystem was amazing. The, the, the um, strategic clarity that it gave to us around how we were actually gonna grow the business going forward. The momentum it gave us leading into a funding round was absolutely incredible. And, and it's absolutely something that I'll, I would recommend that you actually look at tapping into as you go through the, pro the process. Um, tap into your purpose, um, you know, going um, <clears throat> through the journey as a startup founder is, is a very up and down process. It's super important that you're actually really clear on why you're doing this. And, and you can tap into that personally, but you can also tap into it with your team as well. You'll need to be coming back to this all, um, pretty regularly because you know, you can have some awesome wins and awesome highs, but you'll have plenty of down times and plenty of setbacks as you go through that journey. So being able to tap into that purpose is critical. Build a brand, build a network out there. Um, at the end of the day, and we'll talk about it further um, as we go through and talk about pitching, but it is about relationships and building trust and building a, a, a profile out there before investors are going to be willing to invest in you. So you need to be willing to put yourself out there and engage people. Keep learning. Um, you know, we're growing, uh, you know, 15 to 20% month on month at the moment, right? So in order to be able to, yeah, that means our business is three to four times bigger in a 12 month period, right? And that means that whatever was working for us six months ago or 12 months ago needs to be reinvented. And, and, and a lot of that's not gonna work um, when you're three or four times bigger. So, you know, I guess none of you would be on this journey if you weren't um, uh, avid learners, but I would say be absolutely, um, uh, not ruthless, but, but be really determined to actually seek out the very best resources you can to actually develop yourself over time and know that whatever you're doing now, you're gonna to have to relearn and reinvent the wheel as, as you go uh, forward as well. Just um, going on the topic of learning and the whole founder tips, yep. uh, someone's asked, uh, what level of financial literacy is needed by a founder when seeking institutional investors? Um, you don't need a huge amount of financial literacy. Like you, you will certainly need to be able to um, develop a financial model, um, which you could actually have an account or someone else help you with that model. Um, and you, but you will need to be able to actually explain that model and talk to it and understand and, and, um, and yeah, and to be able to actually communicate with confidence that you understand that um, and you can actually deliver on that. Um, the other thing is we'll go through um, a little bit later on, um, you know, some of the things, some of the different elements that will be in a term sheet, right? 
Um, now, what the term sheet, it sets out the main elements of a fundraising round and, and, and the terms that, that investor is going to invest in you. Now, there's a lot of complex stuff in there, right? Um, it is super important that you understand that when you're going through the funding round, um, but you can get help in terms of um, yeah, and advice in terms of how you structure that when you go through the process. So it's not necessary that you know, you're an expert in, in, in it right here and right now. Most startup founders aren't, but by the time when you're ready to actually sign on the line and when you're negotiating the details of that, you absolutely, absolutely need to understand how it all works. Okay, so, um, so let's just flip it for a minute and let's look at it from an investor's perspective. And, um, you know, just uh, we actually uh, earlier on today, um, a colleague of mine shared um, some um, data that we've actually just reached a significant milestone at Cake. We now have 50,000 investors on the platform. Um, so, you know, we spend most of our time talking to founders, but the flip side of that is, you know, there's a whole bunch of investors that are actually on the platform as well. So let's look at it from their perspective for a minute um, and think about what they actually want. So for an early stage funding round, they're going to be looking for at least 100% per annum return. So what does that mean? It basically means that if you're raising money every 12 months, then the valuation on your startup needs to be doubling every 12 months, right? If you're doing it 18 month increments, it needs to be at least one and a half times higher than it was the last time you, you raised, right? Um, so, so that's, that's what you're going to be looking at in early stage. And to give some framework to that, um, most early stage startup investors um, would say, you know, out of 10 investments, um, seven of them are basically going to be duds. So you're not going to get any money back on them. Two of them, you might actually get a break even return on it. Okay. So maybe you, you get a little bit of positive return but not a lot of positive. As a, generally what you find is one um, uh, investment out of those 10 out of an early stage investment will be the one that delivers the majority of your returns. So if they don't think you have the potential to deliver those returns and be that outlier that generates the majority of the returns out of the portfolio, they won't invest in you to start with. And then later stage, obviously the expectations come down a bit, but even when you're going and getting a VC to invest, they're looking at a 20x plus return over a, over a five to 15 year period, right? So what does that mean? Um, it means you need to be realistic about what you're gonna be able to actually generate in return. Um, it also means that there are businesses out there that are fantastic businesses that would be able to generate, you know, 10, 20, no, probably not 10, probably 20, 30, 40, 50% uplift in, in earnings year on year, right? Um, and they're great businesses. So that, that's fantastic. But if that's the business model that you're actually looking at, don't go and pitch to an early stage startup investor because it's not gonna measure up to the actual return expectations that you want. So you, you might wanna go and get debt funding or might wanna look at other sources, but just make sure that you're actually clear about what the expectations are of the investors you're gonna be talking to. Okay, um, so um, yes, running a funding round is a financial transaction, um, but it's also a relationship and it's also a marketing game as well. Um, so it's really important as you go through um, a, and you start to actually build out your investor list, um, you do research on your investors and you build relationships with them. We ran a, an event uh, about, um, three months ago, which was a, a, a women um, in startups um, event. And we had on the panel, uh, Jack from um, Airtree, and we also had Holly from Carded on that, on that panel as well. Now Carded have just run a $14 million seed round, which is not bad. Um, and, um, you know, many people would love to be able to actually um, run around like that. But Co Holly made a really interesting point. That was actually her second startup, right? Um, and she said, look, the, the people that I raised money off for this round, I started building relationships with them seven years ago when I started talking to them about investing in, in, in my initial startup, right? And then Jack uh, reiterated the same thing. She said, look, as, as, a, as a, a principal at Airtree, um, I would 
pretty much never invest in a startup where I didn't have a certain level of relationship and trust built with those founders. And generally, in in 99% in of cases, that's going to be something that's built over time, right? So it's really important that you invest in that as a startup founder who's actually running around. And that's why you need to start that process realistically six months before you want the money in the door. So start reaching out to investors, start engaging them, keep them updated about um, the progress um, that, that you're making with, with your startup. Keep them updated about some of the challenges you've got tap into them. They've probably got experience and, and, can have, and, and can help you as well. So it's a really important that you do that as well. Um, so let's just go on to some of the technical stuff now. Um, we've talked about sort of overall framework. Um, so what are some of the things you need to do really early on? So you need to get a company set up, absolutely do that. You need to think about founder equity. Right? So what am I talking about founder equity? Yeah, um, most of you will actually have a, a co-founder at least um, uh, in your startup and a lot of investors won't invest in, in single founder businesses. So that's something to be aware of. But um, just because you have two, two, two co-founders in a startup doesn't mean a 50-50 equity split is necessarily the right equity split, right? If one of you is contributing a lot more of your time, a lot more of your energy or whatever to the, to the startup, then a 70-30 split might be the best split for you, right? So it's really important that you actually consider these things and have those conversations early. There's other things like founder vesting, which you might want to be looking at as well. Now, what does that mean? Founder vesting means that if one of your founders leaves early on in the process, they don't get to keep all their equity, right? So we have seen situations where you know, two co-founders, 50-50 equity split, one leaves after three months, but they still got 50% ownership in the business. That's not a fair and reasonable outcome for either of them. But it's also a red flag to investors as well, because the last thing that they want to be doing is coming in and investing in a business where 50% of that's effectively dead equity, right? So it's really important to get these things right. Founder vesting and all that will be actually contained in a shareholders agreement. Um, so it's important you get those documents drafted and, and, and you do a good job with those. It doesn't need to be hard. Once again, we've got, we've got uh, partners that can do that get your ESOP set up and, and get on cake. So really important you get those things sorted early before you're even getting to, to, to start the process of running a fund, funding round. Okay, so we had this question earlier about a SAFE or a CON note. What are they? A CON note stands for convertible note. A SAFE stands for simple agreement for future equity. Um, so both of these instruments allow you, are, are really tailored for um, early stage capital raising. And both of them allow you to actually avoid having to spend too much time and argy-bargy worrying about valuation in that initial funding round, right? And how they work is, um, I give you amount of money today as an investor, um, and then the um, amount of shares that I get and the amount of equity that I get in return for the amount of money I give you, let's say it's half a million dollars, is determined at the next funding round. It's not determined right here and right now. And the advantage of that is by the time you run that next round, right, um, generally you'll have some more traction. Generally, it'll be able to actually um, be easier to put a valuation on your startup. Um, so that's generally how it works. I give you amount of money now, it converts to shares at, at your next price round that you do. Now, how they work is generally in return for giving you the money now, I get a discount to that pricing at the next round. So a, a very um, common discount that we will see is a 20% discount, right? So let's say I give you 500K now. Um, the next price round you do is off a pre-money valuation of $10 million. Um, my 500K will convert to equity at a, at, at a valuation of $8 million, right? because I've got a 20% discount to your pre-money value of $10 million, right? So, so you'll have the amount that I give you now, there'll generally be a, a discount to when it converts to shares. Um, there may also be a valuation cap that's involved with it as well. And generally that, would, that means that, um, let's say you didn't run a price round for um, two to three years, and the next round you run is a $100 million pre-money value, 
well, that's not a great outcome for me because then I've only got half percent equity based on that initial um, investment, right? But that initial investment was really critical to you getting to that 100 million val, right? So generally there'll be a valuation cap in there as well, which will limit the amount that I can be diluted with, with that early stage investment, right? So these are really good instruments for you to use early on. Um, a con note is technically a debt, so um, it, it, that converts into equity. There can be an interest rate you have to pay along with that. Um, that interest portion is generally converted into equity as well. It's a little bit more complex than a safe note. A safe note, as the name implies, is, is easier and cleaner, um, but you can do either of those. And, and generally it'll come back to what your investor preference is, right? So if I'm a, uh, if I'm a founder doing an early stage raise, I'll be comfortable with a con note or a safe. Okay, so let's talk about term sheets. Um, so there are a bunch of things in here which I won't go through and, and, and all, all the detail on. But as I said before, <clears throat> it's important that by, before you sign on the dotted line and you actually accept the investment, investment uh, for a round, that you've gone through all of these and you understand what they are and you don't agree to things which aren't founder or, or company friendly, right? Because it will come back to bite you in the future. So there's things like liquidity preference, which means, you know, if, if the business fails, what's the investor's right to be paid back first before any other shareholders, right? There's any dilution, um, you know, if there's a down round and, and you raise it at a, at a lower rate, what actually happens to them in, in, in that scenario? There's founder vesting, which I've talked about a little bit. There's options pool size, which is your ESOP pool. There's board composition, you know, how many board seats do they get, right? Um, what's the voting rights that they get, right? So things like that, like for example, if you had an investor coming in and they were actually um, giving you 10% equity, but they ended up with um, controlling 40% of the voting rights, that's not a fair and reasonable outcome for them. And the problem is it not only will it cause you issues, um, both now and in the future, but it's also will spook future investors as well. Because if you get a VC coming in and go, hang on, why has this guy got 40% voting rights when he only um, controls 10% of the equity? This is not right, I'm not investing in you, right? So it's important you understand these things and it's important you get terms that are fair and reasonable, both to the founder, but also to the investor as well. There are some red flags, you know, above one times liquidity preference, um, you know, really difficult um, founder vesting terms, et cetera. So um, there's some things to watch out for. Um, in terms of a term sheet, um, a great place to start with understanding these and in fact, um, thinking about how your term sheet lo should look for your deal. Um, Airtree have an open source term sheet um, that you can actually access through them. Um, not only does it have um, the terms that they, they start every deal with, but it also actually has um, an explanation of what each of the terms mean. So I would highly recommend that if you don't know what all these things mean, and, and most of you won't, um, go in and have a look at the Airtree open source term sheet, check it out and start thinking about the terms that are in there. And if you're moving away from those dramatically, just, just be, be careful with, with, with how you proceed and make sure you're getting the right advice around the things you agree to here. There's a bunch of other stuff you'll need to do before you actually um, run around. <clears throat> Most early stage um, companies, when they set up, have a limited number of shares on offer. So you'll generally need to do a share split so you've got enough um, uh, uh, shares available to let's say put, give, some, give an employee half percent um, in options. Um, you'll need to prepare for due diligence. You'll need to make sure ASICS is updated. Um, there are waivers and approvals you'll need to get signed off by your existing shareholders before you run a funding round. There's some modelling which we've talked about, both in terms of actually uh, dilution, but also thinking about you know, when you're setting up an ESOP and that. So you need to be thinking about um, what they look like in future rounds as well. So there is, there's, there's quite a lot that needs to be done here. Some of it can be left until you're close to actually completing the round, but it is important you understand these things and have a plan for how you're going to do it. <clears throat> so we've spoken a little bit about the employee equity and that's you know, obviously a key uh, focus for us. Um, generally, we see most early stage startups start with at least a 15% equity pool, uh, sorry, at least a 10% equity uh, ESOP pool 
it can be up to 15%. Um, it's a great tool, not only in terms of being able to actually attract employees, but also a way that you can actually, you can also use it for advisors and you can also use it for um, contractors as well who are doing sweat equity for you early on. Um, so not only does it align their incentives with, with, with the company set incentives in terms of creating, um, you know, evaluation uplift over time in the startup, but it's also a way to actually preserve your cash flow in the business as well. Because if you think about it, if you're paying them cash versus giving them equity, it can just accelerate the, the, the rate of, of, of burn that you've got for your runway. Um, so it can be a great tool for, for not only incentivizing people, but also actually helping you preserve your, your runway, as you, particularly in those early stages. So let's, we covered off some of the technical stuff there. Let's talk about um, where and how to pitch and, and who you're gonna to pitch to. Um, right. before, sorry, go. Before we go on to pitching, um, yeah. someone just asked, can you recommend any open source term sheets, con notes or safe uh, for AU markets? Yeah, so I would recommend the, the term sheet from, um, from Airtree, which I spoke about before. Um, it's a great question. Um, we actually, within the Cake platform, we have a safe note, a con note template, a subscription agreement template. We ESOP plan rules and ESOP offer letters all built into the platform. So jump on Cake, um, uh, generate and, and talk to our onboarding team and they'll be able to show you how to actually generate those docs in there and, and they're a great place to start. Okay, so now, talk, now we're gonna talk a little bit about pitching and then we're actually gonna talk about what, where you're gonna build your investor list from and, and who you're gonna target to actually invest in you. Um, the most important thing when you're going out to invest is, is, is you, your team, your passion for the problem, your unique insult, insights in terms of solving that problem, and then also why is it now, now the right time for you to be actually doing that, right? So that's, that's really critical that you focus on that first and foremost, particularly in these early, uh, early stage funding rounds, right? Um, so if you want a demonstration of that, then just look at the uh, mission statements for some of the top VCs across the country, um, this one here is Blackbird VC in the middle there. We invest in, in wild hearts with the wildest ideas right at the beginning. So they're not saying we invest in quantum computing or we invest in you know, um, SaaS companies or whatever. They're talking about the ideas, they're talking about the founders and they're talking about the stage that they invest in, right? So it's really important that when you're engaging investors that you actually are able to really communicate really well around why you are the right team to actually solve that problem, what your passion for it is, and then what unique insights you have to it, right? So that's, that's really important as you go through, through uh, engaging investors. Now, um, when you come to pitch, you'll, you'll um, need two different decks. Um, you'll need a marketing deck, and the purpose of that uh, deck is to actually get a meeting with the investors. So that's a, a relatively short and concise deck. It might even be something that you want to actually record, um, talking to that deck in a, in a Loom video and send that out to investors. And the purpose of it is to, is to engage them and get your foot in the door to actually have a more comprehensive meeting with them. Once you do that, um, and once you get close to actually looking to run a raise round, you'll be looking to actually talk to a pitch deck, which will be more comprehensive and it might have 30 to 40 slides in it, right? Um, so, and the, ter the, the goal of that um, pitch deck is to get a, get a term sheet, right? Um, so let's talk about um, a lead investor. What is a lead investor? A lead investor is someone who gives other investors the confidence to actually follow in behind um, and, and also is generally the one who you would um, be most focused about doing due diligence with as well. So in our recent round, uh, as I said, we had Jason Calacanis as our lead investor on our round. But we also had Rampersand, who's a significant VC here in Australia, um, uh, participating in our round as well, right? But having someone like Jason Calacanis, who's investing in it, who's a big name in the industry, is important. Um, so the other, another example of it recently is, is a, um, a startup that ran a seed round. 
they actually raised all of their funds from angel investors. Um, so the actual individual check size wasn't that large for each, each investor. But one of the um, angels that they had um, who committed to invest in them was very well known across the startup community. And because they had them uh, in, in and willing to participate, they were able to close around with 30 angel investors investing in them uh, within two weeks using the Cake platform, right? So it is important if you can um, to actually get a lead investor to help uh, uh, get momentum in terms of your funding and also actually get the other investors lined up behind you. Um, how much should you, I'm sorry. Gonna, yep. Sorry, I'm gonna interrupt again. We've got a few more questions coming through. No problem. Um, so asked advice on building a FIM model from scratch. A, uh, a financial model, financial model? I think so, yeah. Yep. Um, so with financial modeling for an early raise round, um, we do see some investors asking for, um, uh, uh, asking for founders to actually build like a five year model that's, you know, we talk about it here, you know, like a hockey stick model, show me how you're going to get to a, a, a billion dollar valuation. Um, if, if, if you're talking to an investor and they're asking for that and it's a pre-seed or a seed round, then maybe start running in the opposite direction, right? Um, because um, realistically, the, the model that you want will be like a, a, a sort of 12 month, two year financial model. Um, and it's really all about, um, I'm raising money now, what are you gonna do with that money and, uh, until you get to the next logical milestone for your startup, right? And so um, I'll distribute after this, I'll, I'll send you a copy of the Capital Raise Toolkit that we've got. It's got a really good uh, but concise two-year financial model in it um, that really works well for a SaaS-based model. Obviously, if you've got a different type of business, you'll need one that's more tailored to that. But that's the type of model that you'd look, that you, you would want and that you want to be able to actually talk really confidently to when you're actually meeting and, and you're pitching to investors. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, someone else has also asked, uh, do you need a pitch deck done by a professional? Um, like, I think there's lots of tools around there in terms of actually, um, uh, you know, templates and that you can tap into to be able to actually pull together a pitch deck yourself. I would say, you know, it's probably worthwhile getting someone with a design um, bent paying them some money to actually make sure that it looks really good and it presents really well. You don't want to actually go in with something that looks shoddy. Um, but, you know, realistically, the, 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 the founding team should be able to do most of the work in terms of pulling the information together that's required in that pitch deck. But go out and, and talk to investors and talk to people and get feedback on your pitch deck in terms of what's in there. Um, you will get a lot of different opinions, right? So you need to be um, prepared that you want to disregard some of that and take on board that you want, but go and test it and that actually ask them about, you know, is it hitting the right things? Is it talking to the right things? And get feedback and get input on them as well is important. Yeah. Um, they've also just asked, do we need to retain a professional to do evaluation for a Series A? Generally not. Oh, for a Series A, um, you might, you know, you might want more help with a, with evaluation at that point in time. Um, yes. Um, but um, like not for an earlier stage round, no. No worries. Okay, that's, that's it for questions for now. Okay. So how much I, should I raise? Um, look, it, it's really about actually raising the right amount of capital to get you to the next milestone, right? And I've seen examples where um, people have gone out and they really need about a million dollars to get to the next milestone. And they've actually been written a, a dollars which I've taken on board at that time and it's actually created more pain than it's actually um, worth to actually take that money on. So for one, it's diluted them more than they needed to do at that point in time. But two, they've actually, because they, they're given $3 million, all of a sudden they started doing a bunch of other things and they lost focus on what they were able to do and they ended up basically wasting a large chunk of that money, right? So you really need to be thinking about, okay, what's the next logical development milestone for my startup business? How long is it going to take me? What's the amount of funding that we require to actually hit those milestones, add a little bit of buffer beyond it, but don't go ridiculous with the ask for it because it, as I said, it can create more headaches than it actually uh, solves. Um, 
Yeah. So, and, and I, I spoke about the forecast and the hockey stick. Um, how do you actually come up with a valuation? Um, so often coming up with a valuation when you are running a price round is a matter of backward engineering for it. So it is about saying how much money do I actually need to get to that next phase and to get to the next milestone. Um, what, when I do that, um, how much equity am I prepared to actually um, uh, give up in this in this raise round? Thinking about you know you'll be running future rounds as well, and then almost backward engineering for the valuation as well, right? So you need to also be able to look at it from that perspective, and 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 you know to some extent early stage funding funding valuations are still even in a seed and series A is still a bit of sticking your finger in the air. So this is a way to sort of triangulate where you actually need to get to. Um, there usually will be examples of other people running um, similar raises. So um, make sure you're able to actually point out, you know, comparative business models, what they actually have gone through with their raising and, 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 and some of the multiples that they might have actually been able to achieve um, or some of the, the valuations they're able to achieve on their funding rounds. So for us, for example, there's no one really in the domestic market that has a similar model to us, but we are a SaaS-based platform, so we can actually look at other SaaS-based platforms and say, hey, what sort of valuations are they actually achieving at the same stage as us? And then the other thing is we do know there's a very well-established um, uh, cap table management platform in the US that currently has a valuation of about $7 billion, but we can look back at them and we can say, well, what did they achieve in their earliest state funding rounds, right? And we can talk to that when we're engaging investors as well. There are, as I said, um, other valuation methods that you can use once you get to a latter stage. So there's the equity them um, model, which has more, is more comprehensive than the Berkus method, which I talked about for the uh, pre-seed rounds. Um, and yeah, like don't start the conversation talking about how much funding you need. Um, and you will get to a conversation about price and valuation, but but don't start there, right? Um, start the conversation with how much you need. And then as I said, talking about what are the goals, what are the milestones you're gonna hit and how you're gonna do that. Um, so we'll now just talk a little bit about the investors. And one of the really important points you need to do, and, and this is something you need to do really early on in the process uh, and keep rechecking as you go through, is it's super important that early on in the process, you build a really good understanding of the investors that you wanna be engaging and you start engaging them early on in the process, right? So they might be a little bit different depending on the round that you're at, but it's really important that you actually do that early on. So for a, a, a pre-seed round, um, it might be your friends and family or you're bootstrapping or you're doing a hot side hustle or, or whatever that you're actually doing um, to be able to actually get you through that, that round, right? Once you get to a seed round, um, you know, or even pre-seed, you know, angels could be coming in, in, into the picture there, but there's a bunch of family offices around, um, you know, and, and there's also, your angel groups like Brisbane Angels, Melbourne Angels, Perth Angels, Southern Angels, who are very active in, in, in investing in early stage rounds. Um, there's venture capital firms. Um, so, you know, uh, there's obviously the Blackbirds and the Air Trees, but there's a bunch of others and some you might never have heard of like equity value partners or after work ventures. After work were like a, a, a pre-seed investor in ourselves, right? Um, and they invest in, in early stage startups, right? So there's a bunch of, um, uh, uh, VCs out there. Some of them write larger checks and, and tend to be later stages, but um, there's a number that are in the market at the moment. Um, another example of that would be Galileo, who are actually specialising and really focusing in early stage funding as well. So make sure you check those out. Sprint is, a, is another one that's based up in Queensland, who's very active in early stage investing also. Um, one thing that's really important as you build this investor list and you start engaging them is that you build a quality list. So it's, yes, you need the numbers, but you also need the quality there as well. And so make sure that actually when you're meeting with them and make sure when you're building your investor list that you're actually um, really not only you know, 
um, when you're having conversations, not only are they doing due diligence on you, but you're also doing, doing due diligence on them, right? So make sure you understand how active are they in investing in early stage startup. Do they invest in the type of startup that you're actually got, right? A SaaS one or a med tech uh, 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 startup, right? Do they invest in that type of startup you've got? And do they invest in the stage you're at? And do they really have an appetite for investing in your particular startup and your team, right? So the faster you can get to understand that, the better you're gonna be, because we do see a lot of founders waste time talking to investors over an extended period of time and get to a point where they were never gonna write a check for them at the end of the day. So they've wasted everybody's time. So make sure that, you know, as you go through this process, yes, you're prepared. The investors are gonna be do, do, doing due diligence on you, but you're also really focused and really smart about understanding who you're engaging in this process. And you know that they have a realistic um, a, a possibility of writing you a check at the end of the day. If not, don't bother. Um, um, Jump yep. in quickly because um, we're starting to go over time and we've got a couple okay. of questions. Uh, so someone's asked how much um, or how much can or should a founder pay themselves? Uh, <laughs> well, it depends on what stage you're at, right? Um, and generally, um, investors won't expect you to actually like live on nothing, right? Um, but at the same time, um, you know, particularly early stage, you'll be wanting to preserve as much cash flow as you can in the business, right? So um, I, I don't know that there's a right answer to that, but, you know, like for us, I, I know that there's been times where, you know, we've actually set salaries in reference to the amount of revenue that we're making and just said, look, this is the amount of revenue that we've got. This is how much money we've got to, got to go around at this point in time. Therefore, everyone needs to live to that, right? And which means sacrifice for, for, for people at that, at that particular point. But you know it's about actually getting you to the, you know, preserving your runway and getting you to the next, next funding round. Yeah. Um, we've also had a question, why are US investments often 10 times what is generally offered in Australia? I just think it's a deeper capital market in the US and, and you probably also see that even in, in, in Singapore, right? So, um, so offshore market. So it is definitely, um, uh, you know, can be worthwhile thinking about um, not only just the Australian market, but also um, uh, offshore markets as well. So yeah, it's definitely worth exploring, um, uh, you know, uh, and like what we are seeing is we're actually seeing more US based investors come into Australia now. And that was the case with us where we've seen, we were like Jason Calacanis' first investment out of Australia, um, but we are seeing more globalization and capital flows. So hopefully we see those valuations start to even out over time. Awesome. Um, we also just had, can we please get this deck afterwards, which I'm pretty sure you answered before that we yep. will be sent out. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. How are we going for time, um, Murray? Do you want do you want me to keep going or? Um, we're we're five minutes over time, so uh, um, I th I think we can go for a little bit longer. Um, okay. But I'm just a bit conscious that people have to get back okay. to work. So look, the 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 last cup cup. I'm nearly there in terms of finishing off, but the, there there are some other platforms out there. There's crowdfunding platforms. There are also advisor groups you can actually go to help you actually build out your funding funding round. And then also actually, um, you would want them to actually have um, a investment networks that they can tap into as well. Generally, a lot of those will, will work on a success fee. So they're an, an option for you to look at as well. There are some alternative platforms coming out at the moment that are actually not equity uh, funding platforms, but they're actually debt funding platforms. But generally you will need to be post revenue to be able to actually tap into some of those sources as well. So we have an awesome list of resources here. I also have a capital raising toolkit, which I'll send out to you uh, as well. Um, there's a video in intro in the capital raising toolkit. So when you get that, um, watch the video because it'll give you some context around the tools that are actually in there. Um, so yeah, um, you know, thanks for your time today. Um, you know, you know what we're about um, and, and you know where to find us. So feel free, free to you know, reach out at any time. You'll have my contact details. So um, I'm always happy to have a chat with you. Um, and we're used to dealing with founders that really don't know a lot about this topic. So we've got those tools and we've also got the team that can help you navigate through it as well. 
Um, there are some, there are some um, uh, discounts that we actually have available via Tank Street Labs as well. So we'll also send out um, uh, details of those as well to you. Um, and so make sure if you do sign up to the, to the Cake platform that you're actually using, taking advantage of the discounts. It is free for your first five investors, right? So it's, it's, I would encourage you to jump on, have a play uh, with the platform and, and have a look at it because it's free until you go uh, over to your sixth investor or employee. Um, and, and yeah, once you do that, um, the price is monthly based pricing thereafter, but um, it's really super easy to get on and have a look and, and have a bit of a play with it. So I'm, I'm happy if you've got any other questions, I can actually take them at this point in time, or I'm happy for, for people to hit me up offline. Um, I think you answered pretty much everyone's questions. Um, awesome. We'll wrap things up. Thank you so much for presenting for us today, Cal. Um, thank and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as we said before, this session was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. We will also send out the pitch decks or all the decks from today. Um, and if you have any questions or any further questions, please feel free to reach out to Cal or myself. Um, and uh, to gain access to more of these kind of exclusive lunch and learns, online events, um, and even in-person events. Um, you can find out more from the Tank Stream Labs website, from our digital membership, our in-person membership as well. Um, thank you, and I hope every, oh, everyone has a good day. Thanks, Mara. Appreciate it. Cheers.